Hey, it's Greg Brown. Grab your logbook because it's time for Flying Carpet Podcast Flight Number 13, Mayhem Beneath Our Wings. Some of you know me from my long-running Flying Carpet Aviation Adventure column in Flight Training Magazine or from my popular aviation books. I'm a former National Flight Instructor of the Year and a Barnes & Noble Arizona Author of the Month. I'll share more about my activities following today's episode. The Flying Carpet is a four-place, single-engine Cessna 182 light airplane. In it, my wife Jean and I have long traveled the North American continent, searching behind clouds for the real America, and experiencing aerial adventures like today's all along the way. Learn more at my website, gregbrownflyingcarpet.com, and join me on social media by searching Greg Brown Flying Carpet. You'll notice I'm currently doing no sponsored advertising, so if you enjoy my podcast, please buy the Flying Carpet a gallon of Avgas via my Greg Brown Flying Carpet website. Better yet, please consider subscribing. Thanks in advance for contributing. Okay, everyone, hop aboard the Flying Carpet, buckle your seatbelts, and prepare for takeoff on today's adventure, Mayhem Beneath Our Wings. Clear prop. Look, said Jean with horror, there's been a terrible crash. Glancing downward, there was just time for me to glimpse carnage on Highway 202, the Red Mountain Freeway just east of Phoenix. A few hundred feet below us, flames and blackened vehicles littered the roadway as we crossed low on final approach to land at Falcon Field. Stunned, I reported the shocking sight to Falcon Tower only to receive some impassive answer like, thanks for the report, or I'll check on it. Obviously, the controller had no idea of the magnitude of the highway pileup, which we found very disturbing. Do you think we should report the accident to the police, I asked Jean after landing? Surely they know about it by now, she replied, with all those vehicles involved, some on fire and smoke billowing into the sky. Boy, am I glad we were flying today, not driving. Surely there were fatalities. All the way home, we'd fretted about it, and for days afterwards, scanned the newspapers for details on the horrific accident. But to our surprise, we never found any mention of it. Fortunately, that incident was long forgotten when a year or two later, Jean and I lounged in front of a movie with her brother and sister-in-law, Dave and Barb. We were 20 minutes into the film, The Kingdom, following an enjoyable family dinner when Dave yawned apologetically. This film isn't nearly as exciting as the previews would lead you to believe, he said. I thought I remembered seeing explosions on the advertisements and cars flying through the air. That's why I selected it. Nodding heads around the room mirrored my brother-in-law's lack of enthusiasm. The Kingdom tells of U.S. investigators assisting Saudi authorities in probing a terrorist massacre, but so far the focus seemed to be more on bickering between Saudi and American team members than on any actual progress in the plot. Dave floated several half-hearted queries about ending the movie, but without adequate conviction for anyone to actually push the stop button. Besides, we'd already checked the listings and could find nothing better to watch that evening. Ever so slowly, the movie's tension grew as U.S. investigators assisted Saudi authorities in probing a terrorist bomb explosion. Together with the movie's characters, we sank slowly into complacency until finally and without warning, the action picked up. As the good guy's caravan traveled a Saudi superhighway, 
Their SUV was rammed from behind, rolled repeatedly, and skidded upside down while other cars around them crashed and burned. Then, from between gory pillars of flame and black smoke, terrorists opened fire from other nearby vehicles. This is more like it, exclaimed Dave, clearly feeling vindicated. In the midst of the mayhem, Gene noted the similarity of the Saudi desert to our own Sonoran desert. I wonder where this was filmed, I said in unthinking response. The highway signs are in Arabic, said Gene. Yeah, but those could be changed easily enough, either by covering up the originals or through computer editing, observed Dave. Between the sounds of gunfire and explosions ensued a brief discussion about desert flora. While the Saudi desert, as we understood it, has little indigenous plant life, Arizona's Sonoran Desert is populated with unique plants found nowhere else in the world, most notably the giant saguaro cactus commonly pictured in old westerns. No distinguishing plants were visible in the crash scene, but I couldn't free myself from some subconscious familiarity with the sight. Once raised, the notion tormented me through the rest of the movie. Still intrigued afterwards, I lingered in the living room, reviewing the movie's filming the crash scene bonus segment while everyone else convened in the kitchen for refreshments. Frankly, I found the explanatory segment with its modified cars and crash scene simulations more compelling than the movie itself. But nowhere was the filming location disclosed. Could this be? I wondered aloud. But no one responded over the talking and laughter. I was still obsessively panning and forwarding through the film when others returned to the room. Watch this clip, Gene, I said. Could those be Suaro cacti in the background in the Mazatzel Mountains? It's hard to tell, she replied. Why do you ask? Frustrated, I replayed the film credits through the usual endless and obsessively detailed minutia comprehensible only to movie makers. I almost gave up upon reaching Drivers for the Stars, but then my perseverance paid off. There, at the very end of the credits, I discovered diminutive thank yous to the Arizona Film Commission and several other local entities. Now I was certain. Remember, Gene, when we were landing at Falcon Field a year or two ago and descended low across that new stretch of Highway 202 on final approach? You looked down and... The accident! That terrible pileup we saw coming into land. Do you think this was it, Greg? Now that you mention it, I do remember a blackened, overturned SUV among the burning vehicles. Now our discarded memories of the experience flooded back. Finding nothing in the news about the pileup at the time, I'd asked another Falcon Field pilot later that week if he'd heard anything about it. Didn't you see the television news last weekend, he replied, laughing heartily at my concern. No, I said, distressed at his callousness. We were out of town and didn't return till Sunday afternoon. Well, you're getting excited about nothing, Greg. They closed that new stretch of the 202 for a couple weekends to film some terrorist thriller. Supposedly it takes place in the Middle East. If true, that certainly explained why the Falcon Tower controller had paid so little heed to my frantic pilot report. I mentioned the movie-making discussion to Gene upon returning home, and following a brief chuckle about how convincingly we'd been duped, the matter had been forgotten. Until now. After returning home from Dave and Barb's house, I looked up the flight in my logbook and searched movie-making details for the kingdom. Sure enough, our experience coincided with the date range of the filming. Now we knew for sure that my pilot friend was right about the cinematic nature of the crash scene, and that it was indeed filmed on Highway 202, under the final approach corridor to Falconfield's Runway 22 left. 
Rumor has it that sharp-eyed viewers can even spot a neglected English-language Arizona highway sign in the clip, though I have yet to be motivated to look for it. I guess there are shades of truth even from the air. How many other pilots' hearts skipped a beat on short final to Falcon Field that weekend? Gene and I will never know. But one thing is for sure, hopefully it's as close to highway havoc as we'll ever get. Later we learned that most of the kingdom's shootouts and explosions were filmed just down the road at and around Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport. Those were just as happy to have missed. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of my Flying Carpet podcast, Mayhem Beneath Our Wings. Please help me keep this podcast going by sharing your favorite Flying Carpet episodes on social media, by posting reviews on your favorite podcast directories, and by donating via my Greg Brown Flying Carpet website. Thanks in advance for your support. For more aviation adventures, check out my book, Flying Carpet, The Soul of an Airplane, for which I was named Barnes & Noble Arizona Author of the Month. Also, at gregbrownflyingcarpet.com, learn about my other popular aviation books, The Savvy Flight Instructor, The Turbine Pilot's Flight Manual, Job Hunting for Pilots, and You Can Fly. There you'll also find my views from the Flying Carpet Aerial Photography, available in fine art metal prints, and my Pilot Achievement Plaques. Perfect gifts for celebrating and commemorating yours or your favorite aviator's piloting accomplishments. Finally, I invite you to follow my social media sites, most of which can be found by searching Greg Brown Flying Carpet. Search GB Flying Carpet on Twitter. And consider joining my student pilot pep talk group on Facebook. Thanks for joining me on today's Flying Carpet Cockpit Adventure. Music by Hannes Brown. See you next time.